Hello and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video we're going to be looking at opposition faction and uh, faction the Red Terror and the Purges 1917 to 1941. So this is opposition and the crushing of opposition under Lenin and Stalin. This is part of my playlist on Tsarist and Communist Russia for A-level history students studying the AQA unit at 1H. So let's crack on and have a look at the terror and the, the destruction of opposition under both Lenin and Stalin. So we're going to start with Lenin. Um, now, the, the most important body in terror under Lenin is the Cheka. So it's created in 1917 and Cheka stands for the Extraordinary Commission Against Counter-Revolutionary counter and Sabotage. And its job was to find out, discover and destroy all opposition to the revolution. It, it was um, led by uh, Felix uh, Dzerzhinsky, uh, and he was absolutely ruthless in, in, in pursuing the perceived enemies of the Bolsheviks. And this, this, this ruthlessness spread throughout the Cheka and, and the Cheka grew and it, it, it spread. So eventually every region uh, had its own branch uh, and across uh, the, the Russia, thousands uh, were arrested, many of whom were, were tortured and or killed. Now, when Lenin disbanded the Constituent Assembly in January 1918, the Cheka, along with the Red Army, was the uh, organisation that crushed any protests against this. Uh, and, and the Cheka played a really important role during the Civil War. And, and during that Civil War, it, it grew exponentially and it, it, it unleashed this period of, of heightened violence and repression, which is often referred to as the Red Terror. Now, the Red Terror of 1918 to 21, um, it, it, it sees an enormous escalation in, in terms of the brutality and the way that opposition was treated. Um, execution of opponents, which had previously been the exception, now became the rule. Um, prisoners in many cities were simply shot. Um, official records put the figures, uh, the, the number of deaths at the hands of the Cheka at nearly 13,000 in the years 1918 to 1920. Uh, but there are other estimates that suggest that the figure is much, much higher than this and, much, and closer to, for example, 300,000. So why why the increase? Why why this kind of huge push with the Red Terror? Well, part of it was due to increasing opposition uh, and the, the, the workers wanting um, new elections to the Soviets, a free press restoration of the Constituent Assembly. Um, and an overthrow of uh, the Sovnikom, they pushed, they believed, obviously, the, 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 um, the revolution being in their name, uh, and with, according to Marxist theory, they should be sharing in the power, but they've been cut off from the power and it's been held by these, this vanguard, this kind of small group of revolutionaries, and, and they felt that the revolution was losing its way. A, a graffiti appeared in Petrograd saying, down with Lenin and horse meat, give us the Tsar and pork. So, so part of that is, is, is that the revolution doesn't bring the benefits that the workers thought it was going to do, be that in terms of uh, democracy and freedom and, and, and actually having a voice and a say, or be that in terms of the material position, the standard of living. Uh, there was a campaign uh, launched by the left wing socialist revolutionaries who were protesting uh, about the Treaty of Brest, uh, Brest and which had, had ended World War One uh, from the Russian point of view. Um, they captured uh, Dzerzhinsky, head of the Cheka, in May 1918. In July, they shot the German ambassador. In, Aug in August, there was an assassination attempt on Lenin. Uh, and in that assassination attempt, he was shot in the neck and he was badly wounded. And, and that can be linked to the, the, the ongoing health problems, which eventually lead to Lenin's uh, demise. So there was increased support for other socialist parties. Um, the, the Social Revolutionary and the Mensheviks both enjoyed growth and support, um, and, and they were calling for a return to multi-party democracy. All of this, obviously, Lenin wanted to stop, and that is why uh, the Red Terror rose to the degree that it did. So this is about Lenin maintaining the power of the Bolshevik. Now, there are other parts behind it as well. Now, part of it is, is this idea of class warfare. So the, the Cheka spoke at this stage about wiping out the middle class completely. 
Um, but really, what they were aiming to do, uh, most historians agree, is to frighten all social groups into cooperation with the regime. Um, victims included large numbers of workers and peasants, as well as princes, priests, prostitutes, judges, merchants, and, and even children. So 5% of the population of Moscow's prisons in 1920 were children. Um, all of these people were found guilty of, of variations of um, bourgeois provocation or counter-revolutionary activities. So kind of really vague, but kind of terrifying sounding titles. And essentially anybody who wasn't in line with the regime or grumbling about the regime, uh, displaying wealth, privilege, anything like that, were, were liable to be denounced and, and, and arrested. We then get the historical debate in this bit, and this is, this is really, really important. So on one side, we've got the apologist for Lenin, who argued that he was faced with enormous political and economic challenges uh, during the Civil War, and the use of terror was a necessary response to this crisis. The Bolsheviks were clinging on to power. And what he was doing was, was maintaining power for the workers. It, it, it might have involved shooting some of the workers, but that, that's what he would claim he was doing. So, for example, um, the uh, Volker Gonov uh, wrote that Lenin cannot be accused of personal cruelty. The main argument for the terror was to protect the working class. And when you came, you could link this with the ideas of class war above. Once the crisis had passed, Lenin defenders argue he disbanded the Cheka in February 22. So therefore, the, the, the Red Terror under Lenin is a reaction to those trying to stop the revolution and the civil war. Uh, and it's not a matter of cruelty or, or anything else. Now, the crit critics of Lenin just simply don't accept this. They see that the, the, the Red Terror, Terror wasn't a temporary policy born out of desperate circumstances. And Richard Pipes writes, the Red Terror constituted from the outset an essential element of the regime. It never disappeared, hanging like a permanent cloud over Soviet Russia. And, and we will see evidence as I go through uh, the, the detail that would support that, where I mean, the name changes, but essentially some form of secret police that imposes um, terror and the will of the regime and uh, arrests, tortures, murders or exiles the opponents of the regime is a constant theme running through uh, from 1917 all the way through uh, to 41 and, and obviously beyond as well. And so this group points out, although, although the Cheka was disbanded in 1922, it was immediately replaced by the GPU, which continued to the work of the secret police. So critics of Lenin see, see the foundations of Lenin's, uh, the, the foundation of Stalin's great purge of, of the 1930s coming from Lenin's Red Terror. So that they actually the foundation of, of terror and uh, and fear and torture and murder in Soviet Russia is Lenin. And Stalin simply continues that trend and, and does it on a grander scale. Whilst the apologists for Lenin say that the, the Stalin's later escalation was something completely different um, from what Lenin had done, that Stalin was, it was his terror came from paranoia and, and, and desperation, but not from the desperation to, to hold power for the regime, which is this, uh, and maintain the revolution, which was the struggle that Lenin faced at the beginning. Terror and the destruction of opposition is something that Stalin is absolutely renowned for. And what I'm going to, I'm going to do is in the next stage of the videos, I'm going to go through kind of this. Is, I'm going to break it into chunks or, or shorter periods. And we'll start with the uh, with the early purges, uh, 1928 to 1932. Mm -hmm. So in 28, Stalin launched his policies of rapid industrialization and collectivization. Uh, and those who opposed fell foul of the secret police, which is now the OGPU and the Red Army. So any opposition was, was going to be fairly brutally treated because this is Stalin and this is these are his two big policies that are going to fundamentally transform the Soviet Union. Now, the area that met the most resistance was collectivization, and there really was fierce opposition in the countryside against this. Uh, and th this isn't just a handful of peasants, this is thousands and thousands of peasants across the country. Now, any peasant resisting collectivization was likely to be labelled a kulak. And if you were labelled as a kulak, then you were seen as an absolute terrible enemy of the state. And thousands of peasants that were labelled as kulaks were either shot 
or and then we get into much higher numbers we get into the millions were arrested so we've got thousands shot millions arrested and taken to labor camps uh, known as gulags or sent into the new industrial towns and cities and were forced to work so we, we've got essentially slave labor there are a whole range of really extreme examples of things that go on i mean one of the most striking ones are the use of the soviet air force that was called into bombs and remote villages that had refused to collectivize so we we're seeing the full range of terror being used against um the russian people in the countryside who are refusing or, or dragging their feet at all in in stalin's push for collectivization and the the resistance the opposition here was very very damaging thousands well sorry, millions of animals were slaughtered uh less grain was being harvested uh, and all the way through till 34 that this resistance continued by 34 it, it's largely crushed uh, and and we see an inverted comma success here of the repressive action of the regime and, and now to the five years plans the opposition is less overt um but the implementation did lead to an increased level of, of terror Undoubtedly, there must have been some who tried to disrupt the new policy, but the numbers can't have been anywhere near as high as the numbers claimed by the government. So often the victims were managers, engineers, specialists who were described as bourgeois class enemies. Uh, and, and terror was used to motivate managers and workers to meet the demanding targets of God's plan. So... <clears throat> really the only kind of opposition or criminal activity that, that was being performed by many who, who f led to, who faced a terrible fate under this was they didn't meet their targets and by failing to meet their targets then the groups particularly the managers the engineers the specialists were like so we go well actually why have you not met this crazy target we say well you must be a bourgeois class enemy who was sabotaging um our, our great five-year plan and therefore terror was used against them seeing the terror being used then that would motivate all those around them to work even harder we also see uh, early show trials um and we've got the, the shakti um show trial in if 28 in which 53 engineers from a coal mine in the Caucasus region were put on trial accused of counter-revolutionary activity essentially there had been a drop in production in the mine at the show trial they 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 repeated confessions that should probably have been forced out of them using um torture um five of them were executed 44 of them were imprisoned so again we the, we we're seeing here this use of these public trials these show trials to to demonstrate to the soviet people the consequences of failing to hit targets for to not maintain the ever growing levels of production in 1930 we see the industrial party trial uh, and it, at this trial it was alleged that a, there's a well-organized group of party members in top industrial and planning positions who are in the pay of foreign enemies uh, and what they are doing is they are sabotaging the first five-year plan again probably completely baseless um uh, but it, it set up this idea of this paranoia and but also again more examples being handed out to the soviet people of what happens to anybody who is against the regime and standing in the way of the industrial progress in 31 we have what's known as the menshevik trial where leading figures who who played an important role in earlier drawing up the first of the five the five-year plans uh, and the the prosecution of wreckers now found themselves on trial because of their menshevik background so anybody with a, again any slight hint that they could be suspected of not being fully on board and um, fully in Stalin's pocket and doing what he wanted faced the possibility of being arrested, tortured, put on trial uh, and then potentially executed. And so we've got three good examples of the earlier show trials there. By 29, essentially the Soviet Union had filled all its prisons. Um, because there were so many people being arrested and sentenced to long prison sentences. To, in order to deal with this situation, uh, Yagoda, who was the deputy chairman of the OGPU, suggested a massive expansion in the labour camp system. 
And now this, the gulags had first been used by Lenin. And this goes back to our earlier debate about the apologists versus the critics of Lenin. So you can see how you could go, well, actually, what Stalin is, is doing is just continuing what Lenin was doing. And so forth. we have consistency through this time period. On the other hand, you could say, well, look, this is being done on such a different scale. What we're seeing is change under Stalin. So hundreds of new uh, gulags were built in remote areas of the USSR, notably uh, Siberia, uh, where prisoners could be used as forced labor uh, to export its natural resources, such as diamonds, gold, timber, and coal. And by 1934, there were over 1 million prisoners in the gulags. So we are, we're seeing something that had existed, I mean, it existed uh, under Lenin, but uh, you, you remember we'd had these kind of um, prison camps in, in Siberia and even under the Tsar. So we're seeing a continuation through, through Russian history in this. What we're seeing is, is a massive change in scale. Now, the, the arguably the most important and, and central um, issue when it comes to, to terror and the crushing of opposition under Stalin is the uh, murder of Kirov, which then leads into the Great Purge. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at, at some of the details of the case. Uh, we're going to look at some of the theories about what happened, and then we'll go through some of the consequences and look at that this next stage in the terror under Stalin. So in January and February 1934, there was the 17th Party Conference. At this party conference, Kirov was the star. He even received more, more votes than Stalin did. And now this doesn't sit well with Stalin. In December 34, so later that same year, Kirov is murdered by a man named as Leonid Nikolaev. Now, on that bit, there's a little debate. Nikolaev is the person who shoots Kirov. Now, Kirov's bodyguard and some NKVD men died in a mysterious car accident not long after the murder. These would have been key figures, particularly the bodyguard, in giving evidence at what had happened to Kirov. Some NKVD men, which is the secret police at this point in time, uh, received light sentences for their failures to protect Kirov. And then we see in 35, the Noniev, Kamenev and 17 others arrested linked to the murder. Over the next year, there would be 11,000 arrests and 250,000 expulsions of party members. And we really see the terror ramping up at this point. In August 36, we'll see the show trial of Zinoniev and Kamenev and 14 others. In September 36, we see Yagoda uh, being replaced by Yezov as head of the NKVD. And then in 38, we see Yagoda pleading guilty to letting Nikolaev get to Kirov. So the, the consequences of this are really wide ranging. So let's look at the theories. Well, theory A is that Kirov was assassinated by a man called Nikolaev on the 1st of December 1934. Nikolaev acted alone. He had both the motive and opportunity to carry out the murder. He'd have been expelled from the party in Leningrad. Kirov was the head of the party in Leningrad. His ex-wife worked as a secretary in Kirov's office. There were rumours, fairly strong rumours, that Kirov was having an affair with Nikolaev's ex-wife. Among, amongst uh, Nikolaev's possessions were found a map of Kirov's route to work and a, and a diary with a plan of the murder. So the theory one is is the lone gunman theory really and that we we all we, we want to look into big conspiracies and things like this but there's a guy who has the opportunity and the motive to kill Kirov and he kills Kirov and it's as simple as that and the rest of it is a it, it, it is is that things being used by other people for the implementation of terror or or to attack the, the Soviet government of the time. So that's our first theory. Now, the second theory is that what's behind all of this is Stalin himself and that Stalin ordered Kirov's murder. And he had a potential series of motives for this. Kirov has spoken against the use of force against the peasants and against the pace of industrialization, so attacking the, the key policies 
of Stalin of collectivization and the five year plans. Kirov had become increasingly popular with the party and, and arguably more, po more popular than Stalin himself, as shown by the vote at the 17th Party Congress. Uh, now, the, the official result had them equal, but the reality was that Kirov polled more, more votes than Stalin. Kirov had been approached by several, uh, several provincial party secretaries and urged to take over as general secretary of the party. Kirov had rejected this idea and had even gone to Stalin and told him about this. So you would think he, he's now he's putting himself beyond reproach. But with the nature of Stalin, Stalin is still concerned about this, even though Kirov has been open and honest with him about it. So Kira, Kirov's power base was Leningrad, uh, the former base of opposition to Stalin that had been led by Zinoniev. So this, this conflict potentially between Moscow and Leningrad we see again. So we have a motivated um, Stalin. So let's look at then what goes on. It does appear that Nikolaev had had some help from the secret police, the NKVD, in carrying out the murder. He had been arrested before with a revolver in Kirov's neighborhood, but had been released. And remember, this is a regime that isn't renowned for looking the other way or treating potential threats lightly. Kirov is a leading member of the party. You would have thought someone found with a gun in his vicinity is likely to be treated very, very harshly, not released. Um, the NKVD men ha ha accosted Kirov's bodyguard at the entrance of his office building, allowing Nikolaev to enter and approach the undefended Kirov. So they essentially the bodyguard had been distracted. And then we find the, the bodyguard being killed in a mysterious car accident a day later, which prevents him giving any evidence into an investigation which was set up by Stalin himself into the murder. Now, is Stalin launching the investigation himself because Kirov was so dear to him and so important to the party, or is this to ensure a cover up? Because he took personal charge, it was very easy for him to um, make sure the investigation found nothing linking him to him. But for us as historians, look back at it and go, well, this strongly implicates Stalin. Why else would he have taken uh, a personal role in, in this issue? It, does, it seems out of kilter with things that he would normally have been doing. Now, there is alternative theory C, and this is that it, it's it's not a lone gunman, but it, it's nothing, nothing really to do with, with Stalin directly. Uh, and this is the theory that Kirov was a victim of some infighting between the NKVD and the Leningrad party. Um, so Kirov didn't support the replacement of his ally, uh, Medved, uh, who was leader of the NKVD in Len Leningrad. The suggested replacement uh, was uh, Zapor, Zaporozovets, sorry, my pronunciation of all these Russian names is very poor, who was close to Yagoda, who's pictured above me, uh, and the NKVD faction in Moscow. So we, we go back to, we talked about, mentioned earlier, the infighting between Leningrad and Moscow for, for con, con power and, and position. So maybe it comes down to this. It's therefore, uh, Kirov was murdered by the NKVD faction in Moscow in order to promote their own man in Leningrad. So this is a power, a power grab amongst the, the secret police and not directed by Stalin at all. So essentially, you um, pay your money and you take your choice on the, the, the three theories there. So do you believe it's a lone gunman, follow the lone gunman theory? Do you think that this is a hit ordered from the top and Stalin is got huge motive to do it? And this reflects the kind of the basics of, of Stalin's paranoia and the fact that he then had carries out the investigation himself. Which suggests again his guilt, or is it um, Kirov was caught in, in the infighting between the NKVD of Leningrad and Moscow? So we we then got these three theories, and you need to make your mind up on which one of those you think is is the most likely. What is undisputed is is that this then leads to a massive ramping up of terror in Soviet Russia, uh, and we we see this with a great purge of 36 to 38. Now, one of the key uh, elements of this is the series of show trials. Now, the first people to confess uh, to involvement in a, a more detailed plot to kill Kirov are 
Kamenev and Zinoniev, who are put on show trial in 36. And they, are in, they claim to have been involved in Trotskyite um, plots to overthrow Stalin and murder Kirov. They're both shot after the trial and there's a picture of Zinoniev having been arrested above me. And this is all part of what seems to be a big move of Stalin. So to essentially wipe out um, the key revolutionary, the key figures who were revolutionaries alongside him, people, members of the party from the early days. And so we get to the stage that the only the, the only kind of head of the party anybody in any position can re, can remember or has any any kind of affiliation to is Stalin himself. You'll notice we didn't create theory D uh, that um, Kamenev and Zonyev were behind it because we believe these are forced confessions under torture and they are not genuine. In 37 we see another show trial of um, Pyotrkov, uh, Radek and uh, Sokolnikov uh, and in, in this what we're seeing is leading members of the, the Communist Party who have previously questioned Stalin's policy especially on the pace of industrialization being removed and these, these trials demonstrate that nobody was safe uh, after being tortured in the infamous uh, Lubrinka uh, prison they are all confessed to for, forming a anti-Soviet Trotsky center whatever that is, uh, and were shot. So the, uh, essentially, we, we, when it comes to opponents, we see this trotting out of various combinations of these same words. Trotskyite <coughs> obviously is a, um, a key, key reference to Stalin's old enemy, enemy Trotsky. Anti-Soviet suggests that they are in some way counter-revolutionary. They're trying to destroy the, the Soviet Union. Uh, and then in with this, with the censors, this idea that they aren't on the left. Um, in 38, we see another really significant show trial, uh, which include Bukharin, uh, Rykov and Yugoda. So again, some really, really important figures in the party. Uh, and this is probably uh, the most famous of the show trials. It was also the last. Uh, Bukharin confessed to involvement in plots against Stalin and was shot. Uh, Yagoda was arrested in 36, and after torture, he, he confessed to a, a startling array of crimes, um, including, again, we've got somebody else who killed Kirov. Um, he also is said to have killed the novelist Gorky and also his predecessor, the head of the NKVD. So Yagoda, again, and that would fit in with some of our, remember, Yagoda was mentioned in our in, in, in our theories earlier. So um, if theory C would suggest, well, one of the bits of evidence you can back up theory C with is, well, Yagoda said he did it. Um, he also confessed to corruption in diamond dealing, being a German spy and attempting uh, to murder uh, Yezov, who replaces him at the top of the secret police. Yagoda was shot along with his father-in-law and his brother-in-law and his sisters and his sister and parents were exiled. And that's a reflection of quite a common theme, actually, where it's not just the person themselves that are punished, but their entire family is then seen as being suspect. So in 36, 38, we see this period which is known as, as Yezov's China. Uh, and this is um, to do with this figure, Yezov, who's pictured above me. Now, Yagoda had not shown the level of enthusiasm for show trials that Stalin would have liked and, and, and is said to have dismissed them as nonsense. Now, Stalin believed in the show trials as an important mechanism for maintaining control and, and wanted an escalation of the level of state terror in, or, in order to consolidate his own political control and the, the control of the party. So Yezov shared Stalin's vision and, and, and Yezov had worked very closely or very carefully undermining Yagoda behind the scenes, cultivating a strong relationship with Stalin, showing him that he would he would do whatever Stalin wanted him to do. And, and again, lots of people and not just Yezov saw this as the way to promotion in the Communist Party. If you, you showed yourself to be completely subservient to Stalin, that you would carry out his every wish unquestioningly, then that was quite a good way of getting promoted. Uh, and we we end up with, um, yes, I've ended up with a whole series of, of fairly colourful names. Um, it, it, Stalin called him Blackberry, because apparently the, the Russian word for Blackberry in Russian sounds like Yezov. 
Um, my Russian is nowhere near good enough to clarify this. Uh, Yezov was a, a workaholic um, who was initially uh, popular with the rest of the leading members of the party. So they were seen as this kind of really earnest and hardworking and dedicated figure and the kind of person you needed in the party. The, the working hours and, and, and things of the, the a lot of the leading members in the party will be rising up the party, which is phenomenal. But they, the other members of the party would soon realize the real kind of true nature of Yezov and they, they turned against him quite strongly. And he oversaw the most bloodthirsty period of terror. And, and this, he, he, he earned himself uh, the nickname the Poison Dwarf or the Bloody Dwarf. And this is linked to the fact that Yezov uh, was four foot 11 tall. Um, and so again, in more nicknames, so this period is known as Yezhov China, again linked to him. So he's known as a blackberry, a poison dwarf, a bloody dwarf, and the period is known as Yezhov China. Uh, now, he admitted himself that the wave of terror that he unleashed would result in many innocent victims. Uh, so he says, we launched a major attack on the enemy. Better that 10 innocent people should suffer than one spy get away. So if he was to execute 11 people, as long as one of them was was guilty, then to him that was fine. The rest was just seen as collateral damage for, for the good of the party, the country and for Stalin. In 37, Ye Yezhev drew up an arrest list of 250,000 people believed to be anti part of the anti-Soviet elements. These included scientists, writers, musicians, as well as administrators, managers, specialists, engineers, all kinds of different people. And what we can see, and what is maybe one of the differences with the terror under Yezov, other than its scale, is, is, is just this bizarre systems that he worked on. So he implemented a quota system whereby every region was given a number, a set number of people they had to arrest as enemies of the people. So he's saying there are this number of enemies of the people, go find them, and you'd have to meet your quota. So people getting arrested for more and more arbitrary reasons and labelled as enemies of the people because the, the local part of the secret police, under the direction of Yez, Yezov, had been told you need to arrest this number of people. Then even even more bizarrely at this point, then, then, then stated, right, 28% of those you arrest, you must shoot just an arbitrary number uh, and the, the the remainder should be sentenced to 10 years hard labor and he felt through casting this enormously wide net with these random quotas and random percentage of people being shot that he would capture all the key figures that were opposing but obviously in all of this there's going to be thousands and thousands of innocent people who get caught up uh, as um, the, the secret police go out hunting to, to match their quotas and just like in all other aspects of, of, of Russian life but if you were a factory manager you had to hit your quota or else there will be terrible consequences if you are a, a leading uh, member of the NKVD you need to hit your quota of arrests and shootings otherwise there will be grave consequences for you maybe you are part of the anti-Soviet element who, and that's why you're failing to fulfill your duty so absolutely horrible terror at this point and completely baseless as well it's an absolutely bizarre system now at this point i just give up really the the, the we then see one of the most nonsensical parts of the uh, of the pur the great purge which is the purge of the red army in 37 yes you'll notice the date um the this it, it, at this point then um hitler is starting to flex his military muscles and we are they're seeing the potential threat of of of, of war with the with uh, in between Nazi Germany and Soviet Union looming fairly large with the moves in Eastern Europe. And at at, at this point, um, the Red Army is purged. So um, uh, Marshal uh, Tokhachevsky uh, was a hero of the Civil War, definitely Commander of, of Defense, and he was tried alongside top other top military leaders in the resulting purge all 11 deputy commissars for defense 75 out of the 80 members of the supreme military council were shot so the the entire top end of the army has been taken out and this is shown as as the purge wind out even further all eight admirals were shot three of the five marshals were executed 14 
out of the 16 army commanders and half the army officer corps, which is 35,000 men, were either imprisoned or executed. And it just beggars belief. So just for, for whatever reason, they have just decided to wipe out now the, the top end of their army. Now, some of these figures, including the marshal himself, were championed for using the, the most up to date equipment and tactics. And his demise and the demise of those around him left a number of incompetent leaders with no knowledge of military tactics or the knowledge they had would be very limited and outdated in charge of the Soviet military. Um, for example, they started to to return to a heavy emphasis on uh, the use of cavalry on the battlefield. And in the early stages of the war uh, with Nazi Germany, we will see uh, cavalry charges against panzer tanks. They didn't work. Um, so, again, I, 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 some of... Some of this, there must have been something that they they believed that the army was becoming too powerful. They that they had been pumping loads of uh, loads of resources into it with the the, the five year plans as they were going forward. Any other power base that that was independent of Stalin, he resented. I imagine, yeah, Yezov did as well. Any power base that was separate to his own, they wanted their own people in charge of the army. But again, it's one of these things that the beggars belief. We then see, and just the, the the horror continues. Really, we see that then the purge of the Communist Party as, as part of this as well. Um, continued purged in in the 1930s. Uh, the Reutin affair uh, after the murder of Kirov in in the peak year came, however, in 38, when about a fifth of the Communist Communist Party were expelled and many thousands were shot. So they, they are purged. It's not. This is a purge of the party itself to just fully ensure Stalin's absolute control over it. The old Bolsheviks, those who joined the party before 24 and therefore could remember a time when Stalin was not the all-powerful dictator, were the most likely to get arrested, uh, the most likely to get executed. And this is particularly after the show trials of Zinoniev and Kamenev. And again, the older Bolsheviks are more likely to have had links to these two as they had been leading members of the party right from uh, the beginning, right, and, and going back through the revolution. It is, it is estimated that less than 10% of the party membership in 39 had joined the party before 1920. So this is an absolute attempt uh, from Stalin to just remove any kind of collective memory of, of, of the party before him and to ensure his absolute power. Now, we talked earlier about the 34 Party Congress, the 17th Party Congress, at which uh, Kirov was the star and gained more votes for the Politburo than Stalin. Stalin, as I said earlier, fixed the result. And so him and Kirov got the same number of nominations in the official results. However, it, it, Stalin never forgot this perceived humiliation. And when the terror was in full, squi uh, full swing, Delegates who had attended the Congress were in particular danger, and the figures are, sh are shown here. So 1,108 out of the 1,966 delegates were arrested by 1939. So that's more than one in two. So over half of the delegates are, are arrested. So these are people who have, again, it would be seen as a great honour, you, you, a sign of standing in the party to be sent as a delegate, and, and, and these are the consequences of it. Through through the terror, the the party leadership concentrated was concentrated into into Stalin's hands. So um, loyalty to Stalin was the best policy for staying a in power and b alive at this point. So the Politburo was full of uh, Stalin's cronies from twenty nine, where an unwavering support for him was the most important thing. Um, and we, we can see that no matter what Stalin did, these people were fearful to, to in any way stand against him. Uh, uh, Kalin, um, the, the president of the USSR, never asked for the release of his wife, who'd been imprisoned in the Gulag between 38 and 45. Um, Molotov, often seen as Stalin's closest ally, uh, ally, very quickly stopped pleading the case of his wife, who had similarly been imprisoned. Uh, Molotov's daughter declared she had no mother on her application to join the party because of, of, of her mother's arrest. 
So in this absolutely unwavering loyalty to Stalin is the only way to advancement and, and safety. The, the purge of the party, we, we see, um, again, we, 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 we see continuing on. So um, we see Sergio uh, Ozanokadze's, and again, my, uh, uh, apologies for my pronunciation. Now, Sergio was a, a member of the Politburo, but he opposed the excesses of the NKVD. In February 37, he committed suicide following a heated row with Stalin, because if you clashed with Stalin, you could be fairly confident in what you knew was going to come next. Uh, he was given a state funeral. The, the official um, cause of death given by the party was a heart attack. Uh, and he's seen really as the, the last of the, the leading communists to, to openly oppose Stalin's policies because of the consequences for opposing were so big. Um, there have been 2.5 million party members in 35. In, by 39, it had fallen to approximately 1.5 million. So big party membership is becoming more and more exclusive and, and its numbers have been absolutely rocked by the the arrest of over a million members and execution of 600,000 of them. When new party members were started to be recruited in the late 30s, these tended to be younger. Um, they tend to be better ed uh, educated than the earlier recruits. A and this is partly because Stalin wanted young people who knew only him and were loyal to only him. And it was partly because he wanted young, educated people who were going to more effectively and efficiently run his five year plans for him. We see increasing centralization. Stalin and the, and the Politburo were very concerned with the amount of resistance to the policy of industrialization and collectivization amongst regional party officials. So part of the focus of the terror was to bring much closer central control over regional party organizations. And we, we see this, for example, um, uh, Georgia, the long suffering in all of this. But in Georgia, we see two state prime ministers and four out of the five regional party secretaries and thousands of less, lesser officials losing their jobs as part of the purge. So lots and lots of um, grim stuff in all of that. And, and I think one of the things it, 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 ele it, it illustrates it is the extent of terror and crushing of any even the slightest hint of opposition. Uh, under Stalin. Now, opposition opposition remains, but it, it, it is really, really subverted because open opposition is a death sentence at this point. The big debates then therefore really are about continuity and change and, and whether the policies of Stalin are rooted in the policies of Lenin when it comes to uh, the crushing of opposition or whether Stalin is uh, it, it is uh, unique in in his attempts and an act, an act of activity, and and therefore whether you you look more favourably on the apologists' uh, arguments on Lenin. So again, thank you for watching. This is is part of my series on uh, communist and Tsarist Russia for A level history. If you liked it, please hit like. Uh, if you haven't done so already, then please do subscribe. There are. Lots of videos on this and other history uh, topics, as well as on A-level politics on the channel. And I hope they uh, help you in your studies or just in your understanding of these different bits of really, really interesting history. Thank you very much for watching.